Welcome to MSL Talk with Tom Caravella, a podcast specifically designed for MSLs and all things field medical. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast. My guest today is Kathleen Bailey, MSL from Synexis. And we talk about what aspects can be taught to an MSL and what aspects need to be learned from experience. So interesting conversation, some good takeaways. Hope you guys enjoy it. Don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn and Instagram and YouTube and uh, check us out on MSL Talk Live on Clubhouse, which is the first Tuesday of every month at 1.30 Eastern time. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Kathleen, how are we doing today? Good. Thank you, Tom. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining me. I'm really excited. Looking forward to having you. And uh, I kind of love this topic. It's a little, um, I know it's a little controversial. I think it's a little clickbaity. I think a lot of people are going to be like, what do you mean you can't teach someone how to be an MSL? What are you talking about? So we'll get into that. Before we do, why don't we do an introduction? If you can just tell everybody who you are and, and what you're up to these days. Sure, thank you. Um, first off, I'm going to do my disclaimer that my opinions expressed are solely my own and do not express the views or opinions of my employer. So let me tell you a little bit about um, where I'm at and uh, my background. So I, I am a nurse practitioner, and then I got a PhD in 2015, and then I bridged into biopharma in 2001. So I've been in biopharma for the past 20 years. Um, and uh, 16 years of those, I've been a field-facing medical science liaison um, based in the West Coast. And I um, had the opportunity to work in startup, medium, and large biopharma companies, and also been exposed to the different stages that an MSL can get exposed to, including the pre-launch, the post-launch, you know, label extensions and competitive drug launch activity. So I feel very fortunate, kind of had the breadth of the situation as far as an MSL. Yeah, for sure. I know you have a great background. I know you've been doing this a long time. And I know that you've coached and mentored and trained a lot of MSLs. So this is going to, I think this is a really interesting topic. And I'm looking forward to hearing your insights on what can be taught and maybe what just needs to be learned from experience. So let's just jump right into it. And let's start with that. So what, what do you think can be taught to an MSL? Okay, so let me share a quote that kind of drives this, which is, we, we can teach from experience, but we cannot teach experience. So I like that that kind of lays kind of where I'm going with this. So although, again, like you said, I, I have taught and mentored new MSLs, the time that they the time will give them the experience but whether they can effectively perform the role also takes certain aspects that cannot be taught. So these, but again, to your point, it's kind of like you said, it's a little controversial. It's like, hey, you know, but these, we'll speak to those as well, but these, these two can get better over time, but you know, whether or not they can effectively do the role, there's some components that just, you know, again, you can't teach. So let's go with what you asked me, which is, um, what are some aspects of the MSO role that I, that, you know, I can teach. So coming into the role, you know, it's the foundation. It's, it's, it's all the variables so they can do their job. It's, you know, they'll, those are learned, right? So the therapeutic area, what the drug is all about it. Um, also the anatomy and physiology of where that drug's going to work within the system. And then even the patient, what that's going to look like, what are those patients like it currently, the current treatment options that are going on, those kinds of things. Again, these are all factual that you, you the edu that lay the foundation for the MSL. Um, also kind of what publications are relevant in, in the current, again, therapeutic area and drug. And then um, any medical and scientific information. So again, this is kind of a, what's gonna happen in a training with an MSL. So they're gonna be provided all these topics and concrete information. Um, the disease state in general, all everything there is to know about the drug. And then finally, which is most important, is the policies and procedures, because that is kind of the part where even though it, the MSL will learn those things and be told those things, to walk that line, it gets a little tricky 
you know, you want to understand. And I'll talk a little more about that and what I mean by that. But that's kind of like your, again, your foundation. So those kind of things are just, again, here you go. And that's the tools. Yeah. And there, I mean, look, we know that it's a complicated role. There's so much that needs to be taken into consideration. And there's so much training that's required. And, you know, we didn't even get into compliance and the pitfalls of, of not being trained well in compliance. But just to kind of jump ahead a little bit. So that's a quick overview of what can be taught. How about a quick overview of what you think might not be easily taught? Yeah, the top line is, there's kind of two parts to it. One, and I alluded to some of this, but first off, some of the aspects I think that cannot be taught are com communication, um, engaging the HCPs, and then building trust. And these are kind of top line things. Um, in addition, the part two would be, you know, if you're fortunate enough, this is again, an experience thing, but it's also there's learned things within the stages of the MSO, which I spoke to. So those different stages where you can come in pre-launch of the drug, post-launch of a drug, you know, and then if there's a competitor that's going to come on the market and then there's ongoing activity. So you kind of, those aspects, there's, there's pieces of that, that again, take exposure you know, time and exposure, but will they, will someone be able to do it well? You know, again, you gotta have to apply all the aspects of things that can't be taught as well that roll into that to see if they're, you know, gonna be successful. Well, and I, I think, so in a former life, before I became a recruiter a million years ago, I was, I worked in the field and I was a sales trainer. I was actually a field trainer for many years. And the ma I remember the managers coming to me and, and asking me like, you know, Tom, you have to, you have to take this person, take them under your wing and teach them, like, give them your finesse. And we, there was an, ex, like, I used to use the expression, like, you know, you can't teach height. It's kind of like either you have it or you don't. But I, I, as much as I would say that, I also kind of disagree with it. I think that if there's anyone out there, if you want it bad enough, you can learn it and you can experience it and you can get good at something. The thing is, you really have to put yourself in the right position with the right mentors, having good examples, good training, and you have to put yourself out there. So do you believe that if you have somebody maybe that might struggle a little bit with some of the softer skills or some of the stuff that doesn't come naturally, do you think that with enough counseling and mentoring that anybody can be get themselves up to speed and bring them to a place where they can be a performer if they just had the right teacher and the right coaches and the right guidance. So yes, in that, but I think that's half, half of it. So you mm -hmm. alluded to the other half. So yes, I think they can. And I said that when we talked, we we're talking earlier, like it can get better over time, mm -hmm. that the things that you can't teach, but it's going to take the person, like you said, they want it bad enough. I've had examples of um, an example being, let's say an MSL, you know, uh, if I'm doing um, a, a presentation or a, pro a program, hey, can I listen in on that? So they're gonna take an effort, a concerted effort to start to hear how someone else that's experienced is doing the role or, you know, and alongside that shadowing, if you will, or paying attention and seeing how they communicate and how, how they might do something well, and then start to embrace that. So you can tell them, you know, go and talk to your KOL. And in other words, you know, so the, the idea is you get the, all that training I talked about and it's like, there's no practice period. And then, and, and you kind of mentor, but you're not there hundred percent of the time. And so you, you can tell them, go speak to the, go speak to your KOL. Here's what you're going to engage around. And then, you know, how they're going to go about it is, is, you know, there's certain aspects that again, you're coming back to somebody, they're gonna be, oh yeah, like objection handling, I'll just throw mm -hmm. one out. Like, you know, objection handling is not for everybody. <laughs> I mean, they don't know, you don't necessarily, or you have a disgruntled healthcare provider with the company, something maybe. So things are gonna come at you that are only gonna come at you right at that given time. And you can't teach that. It's gonna be a one-off, right? So that's something that they're gonna be exposed to and how are they gonna handle that? And how are they gonna know what they're listening to with the HCP, and we'll just get you know a little bit like that. So, how are we going to know what they're if what they're listening to? What's good? What's not good? What should right. they be bringing back? What's intel? What's not intel? You know, those are kind of like little nuances that 
again, maybe you, you start to gain that understanding over time. I agree with you that people can get can get better, and you know, but I didn't. You can't teach that. It's they're going to have to be exposed. No, there's there's you, know? you have to be battle tested. It's, battle tested. It's and I think that that's a big part of it. But I think that in in my experience and from doing this podcast and talking to so many MSL leaders, there's a recurring theme that I keep hearing, and that is that the best performers are the ones that raise their hand and they ask for help and they say, I experienced this and I had trouble. What would you do or what's your advice or how do I overcome that next time? So now they're taking the initiative and they're saying, okay, that's never going to happen to me again because I know how to handle this situation. And then maybe if you take enough initiative, you can ask about a bunch of other scenarios. And then that brings you that much further down the curve. I mean, does that sound like good advice? Yeah, it does. It does sound like good advice around the things I, I was speaking to where you're right, battle tested. That's exactly what I was trying to describe. That's a perfect way to describe that. But I'll give you a part two that when I spoke to like what you can't teach, which, which is really huge with this role is that ability to build trust with the mm -hmm. healthcare professional. So some of these two is, um, Okay, an example, people, you know, sometimes some people have a problem saying, I don't know, okay? Mm -hmm. That's the best thing you could ever say, get you farther than anything else that you might otherwise say to a healthcare professional. Don't be afraid to say, you're coming in there as the expert, but you don't know everything. So saying, I don't know, gets you so much farther. And that's something, I don't know. I, I don't know that necessarily everybody has an easy time doing that. So that might be a hiccup where it might not change. It's just kind of a, you know, where you stand kind of mentally. And then um, the other thing is follow through. Mm -hmm. uh, do what you say, say what you do, mm -hmm. okay? And be, be efficient with the HTP. Those things are really attributed to building that integrity and building that trust with the HTP so you constantly have that rapport right out of the gate. And so, and then listening, a lot of listening, you know, effective listening. Um, the HTP needs to feel like they're heard. So I know we go in there with an agenda, but that's, you know, this is a sales situation. In pharma, big picture, we also go in with an agenda from a scientific side, and there's things we are prepared to speak about, but a lot of things get, go off the rails, and they have something else to speak, and listening will get you will get you a lot more information, and, and they know they're heard as well. So those are kind of the, those, to me, those last ones, what do you think about, like that I talked about, you know, those are things that sometimes from a behavioral or personality perspective, not everybody can do it, Right. do those things. But let's go back to the I don't know comment. Okay. So, yeah. that, but because I think that's hard for some people. I think some people yeah. think that I'm coming in here, I'm a subject matter expert. I have to know everything. So, how do you handle that? You know, you KOL hits you with something that you're, that you just don't know the answer to. Do you just say, well, that question is very important to me. I need to go back and get some research so that I can fully answer that. Or, or you don't just say, I don't know. <laughs> like, exactly. Like, how do you handle that? That's exactly. So you're in the right lane. So I just stopped with the I don't know, but the, I, I was just being blunt about it. But yeah. the, yes, you, yes, you're going to be very right. To, you, you're, you're right on right on top of it. So the way you respond is essentially, it's like you don't have it right there at your fingertips. So that's really the I don't know. It's yes, I, it, maybe it's not top of mind. And you don't certainly don't want to guess. Not, not when it comes to the drug and the information, it's important information. So you say yes. Oh, yeah, I, I don't have that information. That's a very good question. I'm going to go ahead and I'll get back to you. I'll, I'll go inside and internally I'll find out that information and I'll be, I'll, court, I'll, I'll email it to you. What I do, and, and that's another thing is I, I, on a, on a, for when I'm going to leave the conversation, I'm going to end the engagement with the KOL is I've got actionables and I reiterate those actionables right to the HCP when I'm about to leave. I circle like, hey, I'll be following up with this on this question you had. Um, I'll be blah, 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 A, B, and C. Okay, they're written right down, and I say them out to the to the HCP right before I leave. So that, I think that's another good kind of behavior that just kind of closes. And that's your ceiling. I heard you. I'm going to do these things, and I'll get back to you. So yeah, and then then hopefully you do. You know, and you need to be efficient about those things, and you need to fight. I like I said, do what you say, say what you do. So those would be like that piece of that as well. No, that's great advice, and I think that. Um learning and again getting back to like mentorship and good leadership learning what's the right way to handle a situation where you don't know and 
what are some of the, the best questions you can ask KOLs? What are some of the best engagement strategies that some of your peers have found success? I think that that's really important as a newer MSL or even an experienced MSL that might be in a situation that they haven't been in before. Ask somebody, how did you handle this? If, if you were in this situation, what would you say? What questions would you ask? And I think that that's really important because sometimes I just remember being out in the field and every once in a while, you get flat-footed. You get hit with something You're like, geez, I didn't expect that and I don't know how to handle it. And obviously you do the best, you kind of deflect and then you promise that you'll get back and, and you know get the right information. Um, but I just think that it's important to be vocal and, and to utilize your internal network of resources to be able to educate you, not just on how to handle that situation, but maybe there's some other stuff that you can learn from that person at the same time. So I know I probably said that, that's probably the second time I said that. So I'm getting a little redundant, but I wanna talk about um, the nuances of, cause it's, it's a, this is a tricky job there's pre-launch, there's launch, there's post-launch, there's compliance issues and training, and there's COVID now, so there's digital, and there's all this stuff. So let's just throw out the, how do you navigate in these difficult waters, and is there a difference in what someone needs to, how someone needs to approach small company, maybe pre-launch, or even large company, pre-launch versus launch versus um, post-launch. Does that make a difference? Yeah, it is, it is nav navigating. And it, essentially too, you know, it's not kind of like, oh, what I like to, uh, the MSL role can vary and on the responsibilities in those stages that we're talking about here because um, based upon the resources or the size of the company. So, you know, it, it, it can come at you, there's a lot going on and you may have a hand in a lot or very little in, in the MSL role, again, based on the, the resources are going in. But it, again, it's exposure plus time. And if you, some MSLs probably have gone through their current, you know, experience that they have so far and they maybe are just in approved drugs and that's it. There's usually something going on, um, but not necessarily. They've expand. Maybe they're going to get a label extension. So they're not everybody's exposed to these stages, but they are delicate, like you said, because the pre-launch of a drug is really the only the only boots on the ground, if you will, or are the MSLs because there's no commercial team yet, and you can't talk commercially or promote anything because there's no drug approved. So we're essentially again that drug. So again, you could be in a pre-launch be a team already in a company, right? Or you could just be a startup where it's their first and only drug or the company is already existing and, um, and you're a team and now we're gonna bring, we're, we're gonna launch a, another drug onto your plate. It's a, but it's the same idea no matter what in this, in this pre-launch phase, if you will, it doesn't matter. So how you deal with this one drug and how the MSL um, will behave, okay? So uh, essentially you're waiting on the drug to get approved. So let's say it's a new therapeutic area. We'll just go after it like that. You know, not, you're not in the same, you're not swimming in the same pond. So either way, small, big, or large. So you're going to identify the nuances here. Are, who are your KOLs? So you have to be thinking, how do I get to these people? Um, nowadays, maybe some lists and things, but you want to get smart about it because it's a moving target. And so um, think about who's already touched the company that's in this therapeutic area because they're ramping up. So let me back up a minute. So, right, the MSLs are coming, like MSLs are coming into play in the pre-launch. There's already been a payer meetings going on, ad boards litmusing these experts way back. They're leaning way back, way before you are introduced. So that, that, again, when I say touch the company, that's why I was thinking like, oh, these, you know, these experts who are, um, have already been on these ad boards. You've already got a few of those there who's participated or knows the company. That's what I mean by touch the company. That's of course on your list. And now the other criteria you're gonna be thinking about to get your collective list of KOLs, the publications, if they're on the guidelines committees, things like that. So that's one element, get, get your bucket of KOLs or your healthcare professionals, mm -hmm. um, you know, right? Get that, get that going and then what are you doing? What are you doing? Remember, you're the only field facing team because there's no sales group. So, but what can you do? So you say delicate. So you can only talk about disease state. You can't go in and talk about the drug either. 
So you're really increasing awareness around that disease state that that drug is coming on board for and kind of raising awareness and litmusing your healthcare professionals around how they practice with that disease state and now how their current treatment is going in that disease state. So introductions, you don't know them yet either. So it's kind of a dual thing, Introdu introductory appointments, which nowadays, as you know, are Zoom. Vir so virtually you're doing these introductory um, appointments. Um, and then also, and then your, your objectives in that call are also to discuss their current practice around that disease state and kind of getting the lay of the land, if you will, on that, because you can't talk about the drug. So then this goes back to, you know, there's a learn as you go kind of thing with yeah. MSLs. And if you're in a pre-launch environment and you're one of the only client facing representatives out there, you need to know the science. You need to, you need to really dig into the science because that's what's going to be paramount for that relationship and for your ability to excel at that point before the drug gets launched, know everything that there is to know. So this is a situation where that can be taught, but I think it's also something that needs to be learned. Am I, am I getting that right? I think you're right. I think the idea that's again, goes back to foundation. So it can be taught. So the, so the company, you, yeah, you, you got to roll up your sleeves. You got to know the disease state, the therapeutic area. And then what is learned is what you hear from the healthcare professional, more about the patient profiling, kind of how the current treatment options are going, how real world, I like to call real world, right? This is called getting real world information when you're talking to healthcare professionals and kind of that rounds it out for you. But you fall, we fall back on again, time and ex plus exposure. So and experience of different thing aspects that we talked about earlier from a behavioral perspective or things that, and this is the early on is kind of when you're gonna come up against a lot of I don't knows. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would essentially say, this is where things are teased out. And this is how you grow because you get, you get um, asked questions. And now if they, again, reactively, if they ask, what do you have, what drug, what's going on with that drug or what do you have uh, that's gonna come on the market or they already know about the compound, once they bring it up, then you can have this conversation, right? Pro, you can go down, you can reactively discuss the compound and that's when you're gonna get some I don't knows because they're gonna start, start asking and you're just early on and kind of understanding the drug. So that's, you grow, you grow from that as well. The I don't knows help you grow as well. Um, and so I think that um, people get better at it, get better in the role um, from a pre-launch for sure, there's an arc from a pre-launch all the way to the post-launch and, and, and after that, you know, and ongoing. Yeah. There's no doubt. It happens every time. And I've done it several times. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we're so just to break it down. So we're talking about we're talking about bridging a gap, essentially. And that gap is from not knowing to you're now an expert MSL. So what, in your opinion, are the best ways for an MSL to be effective and bridge the gap? Yeah, we, we kind of talked about some of these. So this is, I, I will reinforce these kind of things. So I think that the best ways are learn what you're supposed to learn. Mm -hmm. Let's not assume everybody's doing that. Okay, that's one piece. Okay. Do it to the best, Get you know what I mean? All those, all that foundation, there's a reason you're being, you know, roll up your sleeves. How deep you're gonna get in the trenches with the foundation, right? That really go outside. I like, okay. So an example, I'll carry through with that. An example of getting really becoming better at that. You know, there's the Google alerts. I Google alert the keywords to a therapeutic area. So immediately I get publication alerts. You know, weekly or you can set them daily or weekly that tell you anything with those keywords right hot off the press right so you're staying up on all the latest publications you know whether they're your healthcare professional it's authored or not it's in your wheelhouse you mm -hmm. want to be doing that that's how you stay up so it's not just a one and done with the foundation that's how mm -hmm. you get to be better right you keep that going pay attention to all that that's going on and then like you said you have to be that we discussed you have to be um wanting to ask the questions to your um, other MSLs that are experienced. It doesn't have to be one person. Usually you're assigned somebody I've mentored and trained. And then they keep asking the questions. Um, shadow, like we talked about shadow, pay attention to communication. 
when you have an experience and you know, let's talk it out. Like you, you even brought this up too. Say something, um, ask something, um, bring it up to to discuss it through on how how that how tell let the person know how you handled it and then maybe address how better could be handled. Um, you know, I've given given control. I've been watched again. It's important on, okay, so I'm gonna flip it around. So the mentor or the trainer, myself, I have an onus as well. Like if, if there's a new MSL and for instance, they do a presentation, their first one. So now I'm listening. It's gonna to be to an outside audience. I'm listening to the other program. Then I go back and I give them um, objective feedback. I go, I click through, you know, maybe this or that, the new, you know. And again, I'm, nobody's, nobody ever knows everything, okay? I'm the same way. I've been doing this. I, I still look to after a field, you know, um, my manager's with me in the field or my colleagues have been on a call with me and listened to me present. Tell me what you heard. If you have something you think could be done better, let me know. I just had, I, ha I had an example with, a, again, that same idea where I took away from a, um, I, a men, a MSL I was mentoring some great ideas off their program to put into mine. So it's a two-way street. Nobody, you know what I mean? There's never a, an end game here. We're always growing and I'm always not afraid to say, first of all, the I don't know is, is huge. And, and then also I'm not afraid to, um, you know, learn from others and get that objective feedback no matter how long you've been in the game. So you got to rely on your team, obviously. I think that's going to be really, really important always throughout your career. But what about um, what can people be doing or what advice do you have? I love I love the idea of doing the Google alerts because I think that that's pretty simple best practice to stay on top of the game in like just as far as therapeutic knowledge and staying on top of things. But what other tips do you have and advice do you have for MSLs, things that you're doing now that maybe you didn't do earlier in your career. Maybe there's something on the digital front, um, you know, following people on Twitter and just, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just curious. Is there any anything else you want to offer that maybe you weren't aware of when you were newer? Yeah, some of the some of the caveats that are um, just to stay. I think that the publications are big. Um, so that Google Alerts was definitely not something I did all the way through. But some something else that comes to mind too is some of the caveats are like every comp, you know, really dig in, pay attention to the to the conferences, even the regional conferences. And now, I mean, even before they were virtual, it's really important because the company tends to focus on what's national, the major conferences, right? So <clears throat> essentially, you know, there's there's all this regional uh, um, there's, there's also regional conferences going on in certain, in different therapeutic, different specialists, different, um, you know, uh, kind of healthcare professionals. Drill down, look at those, see who's in there, see who's speaking, um, you know, because it's regional. So most likely the attendees are people, you know, people in your area, but the, really the speakers. And that again, and the, the last thing I'm going to say about staying, you know, growing and it's a moving target. This, this, this is a moving target. So again, that's one way you stay refreshed by the publications and who's doing the programs, who's coming up, who's rising up, who's now a speaker, who's giving a topic that's of interest, or even just speaking at all. And that would be somebody of relevant in that therapeutic area for yourself. So that's how you kind of broaden your, your scope and just stay, stay, stay relevant. Pay attention to who's, who's coming up because it's your KL list is always going to be changing and growing. Mm -hmm. So you're an MSL, you've been doing this for a long time, obviously you have metrics and you have goals that you're, you're trying to achieve. So what keeps you motivated? You've been doing this a long time. How do you, how do you stay motivated? The drug. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> not a drug, but the drug, the, the, the drugs that I work with. So I always, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the drug. It's the, the patient first, the drug that's helping that patient and then the people. So meaning internal and external. Like, mm -hmm. I just like the idea of the engagement of, of, I come from a clinical background. So I like the idea that we're helping patients. So when I say the drug, I tend to, I, I, I'm pulled toward or drawn toward or tend to work with, um, you know, more in, different drugs that are like at first in class, or it's really saving lives or it's trying to do something impactful that's really changing kind of the outcome of a patient, mm -hmm. uh, essentially, you know, big picture. So that, that, that drives me. 
So, cause I know it's helping the patient, what the drug is. And then essentially in the end, I just like having that engagement. I, I didn't get away from that because I enjoy it. I like, you know, with the healthcare professionals and I, you know, I'm one as well. So I think that's why it's like a peer to peer. I just have those conversations and the research and, and development and the science is really fascinating to me. And that's why I came over to begin with because I really like the research, uh, 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 the big picture of biopharma and the research. I think that's, listen, I, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer, but that sounds like the right answer for me. I mean, you're MSL, you're supposed to be motivated by science, right? Yeah. Like if you said, oh, I'm motivated by money, I'm just here to make money. I would be like, <laughs> no. oh no, we have to edit that. Oh. Wrong answer, Kathleen. <laughs> and then, this wasn't pre-prepared. I just threw that question out. So I no, appreciate your honesty. And um, yeah. and I, I and I hope that everyone else listening appreciates um what we're trying to do here, which is to um, to really come up with good best practices for people that want to get up to speed fast. I was, was listening to another podcast and they referenced, and I can't think of the person's name, but it was like, they. I think there's a common known um, thought that it takes 10,000 hours to be an expert at anything. But the question is, what are you going to do to bridge that gap and make it so that it doesn't have to be 10,000. Maybe it has to be 5,000. It doesn't take everybody 10,000. So I guess last question for you, is there any final advice that you would give somebody to help them come up to speed faster, things that they could be doing um, that go above and beyond what they might be told by their manager or what they're required to do? I think that, yes, I think a self, you know, we kind of, it gets a little like the same kind of aspects of things, but essentially how are you, are you just gonna, so it's essentially just sitting there, um, getting your KOLs or your healthcare professionals, you know, making your appointments. Um, it, 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 I think it gets done faster. It's that things that are being told to you or at you that you are then doing, you are then also taking initiative. Like I said, you gotta meet in the middle. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to speed up if you meet in the middle and the ways we, the way somebody does that uh, is again, they take the initiative. So they roll like, again, sometimes they're, they're, there's, there's a third party vendor that just hands you a list of KOLs. You're just going to go with those KOLs. That's not taking the initiative. That's not speeding up the process. Who's get in the weeds. Where are the specialists I'm supposed to see? You know, how do I go about finding them? Go to the academics, go to the right, the publications, go just dig it up, get exposure with, you know, your healthcare professionals, get that going. Again, taking initiative on your side, not just letting things get presented to you, taught to you, told to you, and then just, just staying in that lane, but mm -hmm. going outside of that lane with the public, which, which is what we spoke about, proactively looking at publications, proactively looking for who the, who the experts are in your region. And those kinds of things, I think, really speed things up. Um, in addition, I mean, the, the communication part, engaging the healthcare professionals, I don't think you can really speed that up. I mean, so that's gonna take a minute. And those, those situations that I talked about that come to you, that come at you, let's say, um, something you don't know, or they're disgruntled, or you have to handle an objection. I mean, that's going to take time. That's going to happen when it happens. So I just hate to say, like, it, you can't really expedite the situation with that engaging part. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you agree with me on, I don't see a way to really speed no, that I up. I think that when it comes to KOL engagement, I think that yeah. it's really important to follow the lead of the KOL. I think, you know, if the person, if you hit it off, in the first meeting because you have a lot in common or you just wind up having really good conversation and you really nailed it, um, then that's great. There's other situations where you might just not even have enough time or it just might not go as smoothly and you can't force that. So in, to, to that respect, I think that, yeah, that's something that can't be sped up. But I think that just to, in a nutshell, I think in order to, and the one you know, parting kind of comment based upon what I'm hearing is the best way to bridge the gap is to take initiative and yes. take control and go above and beyond and do, do extra and seek out advice and raise your hand and ask questions um, and learn for your, from your mentors. Obviously you have teammates for a reason. So I think that this is all good advice 
And I, you know, I, I think it's, it's obviously there's, there's certain things that um, you can be taught very easily. And there's certain things that are going to develop over time with experience in a nutshell, if I had to. Yes, that was perfectly. Recap. That was a good recap. That That's was re the recap. <laughs> well, let's leave it there. We, okay. we um, we're just a little bit over 30 minutes. So Kathleen, thank you for joining me. This was interesting. Good stuff. I hope everybody really enjoyed it. So, uh, you know, we'll have to have you come back again sometime. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. It was a great conversation. Awesome. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the show. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe so that you don't miss episodes in the future and feel free to leave a rating or a review or a comment. Thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.